the title for today, a subtitle, is Reach HaMelech. Say Reach. Reach HaMelech. The fragrance of the king. Oh, this ought to, just the title alone should just be stirring because we are to radiate. He's coming back to smell us. Remember something I said before? Remember Aaron, the high priest, once a year went into the Holy of Holies? Before he even went there, he had to pay a visit at the altar of incense, that crowned altar of incense. And then as the smoke of that incense began to fill the holy place, it transcended through the veil that was very thick, and it stood, the, 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 the incense stood in the midst of that and entered the Holy of Holies, and Aaron had to stand between two veils, and the Ark of the Covenant staff, staves, excuse me, would protrude out of the veil like that, and it looked like, it was like nostrils, so the high priest could present himself to himself as being righteous, holy, unblemished, making sure there were no bad thoughts and whatnot, as well as to the people. But that didn't hold any weight until he stood between the nostrils of the place where the presence sat so that he can be examined. Like Isaiah 11 says, chapter, chapter 11, verse 3, that he... He would, be, he would smell, basically. He would smell the very essence of what that high priest was scenting off of his life. And see, we're going to get into this today. And I said, wait a minute, something happened to me this week. I had a stuffy nose and I couldn't smell anything. And I had to step back because it's just weird when you begin to dig into the things of the Father the things in the natural sometimes point to something greater, and a whole lot was born out of this weird little stuffy nose this week. Believe it or not. <clears throat> so, Reach HaMelech. And the outline I'm going to look at today, and I believe we should have enough time for this. And those of you that are watching, we want to say thank you guys for tuning in with all of our hearts, souls, and we pray and we ask that you share, 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 share today's message and tag your friends. And um, I'm telling you, this is just this is going to be a very powerful revelation that Abba gives us for many, maybe not for for some. I don't know, but I'm I'm being obedient. The outline for today would be the the name of the Torah portion, the parashat, the enclosement process and the sweet aroma that comes forth from the altar. Look to your neighbor and say, I have a sweet aroma. Young people that are in here, those that are watching, your aroma that comes off of your life is proven by what is attracted to you and what you're attracted to. If the world is comfortable being in your presence, not meaning you go around condemning, we, none of us can do that. But if the world is comfortable with holding a conversation with you for 15 minutes and it's nothing to do with the Most High, something is wrong. The incense in your life has been tainted. Something's off. The type of incense that comes off of your life, the aroma that comes out from who you are will attract the very thing that you already are. I hope you're hearing what I'm saying. I'm saying a whole lot. So let's look at this. Look to your neighbor and say, we're destined to be with Yahweh Elohim. Say it like you really believe it and that this is not a religious uh, merit that we think we, we, we earn coming to Shabbat or Wednesday or Sunday, whatever it is, we can't earn our way into anything. But say it like you mean it because it's for you. It's not for me. It's not a condemning thing or whatsoever. You have to know this. You have to believe this. Make it personal and say, I'm destined to be with Yahweh Elohim forever. I'm destined to be with him. And I'm not going to let anything or anyone rob me from my destiny with him. We can't. No matter what. No matter what. Unwavering. 
unwavering. Hallelujah. Proverbs 6.23 says this, For the commandment is a lamp, and the Torah is light. And reproofs of instruction are the way of life. The word lamp there is ner. And the reason why I'm doing this, you'll see throughout this study. Psalm 119 verse 105 says this, Your word is a lamp, say ner. Ner, unto my feet, a flame, and a light unto my path. The word ner means a flame, a constant, it's it's a flame, that means, think, I want you to think about this for a minute. It's, 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 it's much more than what we think. <clears throat> it says, your word is the lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. In order for there to be a light on the path, you are the one that the creator is looking for to be his flame here on the earth. And a flame needs something to be attached to or it does not exist. Why do you think people, when they light a candle and that wick burns out, the flame, when it burns out, the flame is gone? The flame needs something to to be attached to in order for it to illuminate the very essence and purpose of why it was given. Does that make sense? I hope so. Proverbs 20, 27 says this, the spirit, say the nishma or the neshama, say neshama, Abba, wake this crowd up in the name of Jesus. In the name of Yeshua, wake up. Say, flesh, wake up. Flesh, wake up. Hallelujah. Why why does this flesh need to wake up? Because this flesh is the wick for the fire. The spirit, neshama, say neshama. The neshama of man is the nair, the candle. This is King James Version, so you got to filter through it is the nair of Yahweh, searching all the inward parts of the belly. The nair, I want you to keep that in mind, the nair tamid, the eternal flame. Are you an eternal flame? When it's raining, does your fire go out? When it's windy, does your flame get blown out real easy? If someone cuts you off on the road, is your flame of purity, is it blown out and you know that you have a lighter in your back pocket? Let me deal with this person real quick and then I'll just flick that back on. A lot of us feel like that on the road, right? (laughs) Let's get right into this. Exodus 27 verse 20, it says this, and you shall command the children of Israel. It wasn't a suggestion, it's a command. Commands are good. Children, commands are good. Listen to your mama and your daddy. Commandments are a good thing. Why? They keep you on the narrow path so that you can scent off an aroma that is pleasing to the most time. And you shall command the children of Israel that they bring you pure olive oil beaten for light to cause the lamp to burn always in the tabernacle of the congregation without the veil which is before the testimony, Aaron and his sons shall order it from evening to morning before Yahweh. It shall be a statute forever unto their generations on behalf of the children of Israel. Hallelujah. So the beginning in this Torah portion begins with the phrase where the Torah portion name comes from, Ve'ata Tetzave. Say, Ve'ata Tetzave. And you shall command, or it shall, it can speak of a future tense. It can also speak of a consistent, a consistent instruction of something. The importance of light to constantly be shining is of utmost importance for the people of the Most High. The light of his essence of who he is, the light of his word has got to continue to be illuminated in our lives, especially in these days we're living in. Because it's the Father... He's, de- he's designed it to get darker. He's designed it to get darker and darker and darker and darker. Why? Because he is about to show the power of the illuminating light of who he is in his kingdom people. 
I'm very passionate with what's coming forth today. And I'll give you a little gold, some golden little nuggets you can chew on, but we're going to build up to the essence of what we're going to have today. Are you guys grateful for what Yeshua has done? He's, he's not called the light of the world for nothing. There's no filler material in the, in the scriptures. There's not just, well, just say this in there. Everything is prophetically designed and intentional by the creator through the writers of, of the word that we have. And you shall command. And I found this interesting, very interesting. I said, wait, what's the numerical value of this phrase? It's 913. Why well, I don't believe in coincidences. Why? Because this commandment is to a specific people. The numeric relation to this is equivalent to a few phrases. One of them is bait hamelchut, which means the house of the kingdom. So the command pertaining to the light that is being instructed in the beginning of this week's Torah portion is not for the world. It's for the kingdom people. Because the world is darkness and the Father has a plan through his kingdom people. He said, Egypt will know my name, while the world is going to know his name also. Another Hebrew phrase, itzotzetav, and the fut- it speaks of the future borders of a city or the borders of a crown. So the command is, is given also because of something that the Father sees and something that we are t- supposed to become. 913 is equivalent to a powerful Hebrew word that begins, that is the mother of all Scripture. The mother of all Scripture is called Breshit, in the beginning. That's mama to the rest of the words that would be inscribed to describe the creator's acts from the past, the present at that time, and the future of mankind. Breshit is the mother to the rest of the word of the Most High. In the beginning, or it can say through the firstborn or through the first fruit. It's found in Leviticus chapter 2, verse 12, I believe. The word reshit is used for first fruits. The future of this kingdom will have the borders. Look to your neighbor and say, we've got to have borders in our life. Where there's no borders, the world looks at you as if anything goes. You've got to have boundaries in your life. Look to your neighbor and say, we've got to have boundaries. So this revelation contains something. The future of this kingdom will have the borders of the intention of the beginning. We're going back to the beginning. There's really no future. There's only the beginning in the what would be called the past, the beginning right now, and the beginning in the future. We're going back to the beginning. That's called in Hebrew thought, rabbinic thought, being born again. Being born again is going back to the beginning. So to claim I've been born again, you've got to reflect the beginning. Otherwise, it's your end. 913 is equivalent to another Hebrew phrase found in Scripture. And it's this. Ve Yahoshua Benun Ma Le Ruach Hachma, which says this, and Joshua, son of Nun, was filled with the spirit of wisdom. He would be the successor to Moshe, which would his life would contain the revelation of Yeshua who would bring us into the promised land. You won't be able to hold up the Torah and say, Because I did this. Because I listened to Moses, I have a merit to enter in. No, it's Yahoshua that will bring us into the promised land. We obey and live by this. Why? Because this is evidence that you love him. This is evidence that you love your neighbor. This is evidence that you love your brother and your sister. This is not your ticket into the eternal realm, into the kingdom per se. That comes by way of Yeshua. No man comes to the Father 
But I have a Torah scroll that's 4,000 years old. No man comes to the Father. But I've been living this all my life. Sell everything you got. I can't. No man can come to my Father unless he comes through me. That's how that works. Hallelujah. Now, something very powerful is recorded regarding the altar that is in here, even the rabbis, and I'm going to get to something pertaining to the Haftorah portion, but something very powerful happens within the Haftorah portion, specifically chapter 43 of Ezekiel, verse 17, and it has unique dimensions and specifically two characteristics that I caught. This altar in Ezekiel spoke of another chance of returning for the nation of Israel. This altar has steps in it now. When the temple altar and the tabernacle altar was commanded to have a ramp so that I would not see your nakedness, the Most High said. But the altar in Ezekiel has steps now. This altar faces east when the temple and the tabernacle altar faced, it a, di faced a different direction. Also, there's no mention of that. Remember the copper net that was put in there? You guys remember who, who, provi who gracefully provided for that copper net was good old Korah. Korah provided that net. After they were swallowed up by the earth, their fire pans were hammered down and a net was placed over that altar as a reminder of something. Well, this altar in the Haftorah portion is absent of that. Why? Because all traces of Korah will never be remembered before, will never be remembered again. All the influence and rebellion of Korah, the uprising to overtake priesthood and the sacrificial offering that is given by Yeshua at his altar will not even allow the influence of Korah to come near that altar place. That altar in Ezekiel 43 is absent of that. Why is all of this? The steps speak of the shame being removed. And these are the steps that are found in the descending and the ascending order of Yeshua in Philippians chapter 2. Because of the steps that he took, the steps that he took back gave us access to come through those steps. Why? He absorbed your shame and mine. The shame is gone in that altar. This is the, the Haftor portion. Facing towards the east because all idolatrous, idolatrous worship will no longer exist and the calendar system will be restored for perfect balance in the universe. As opposed to the other altar, you're not to face the east. Why? It was, it was symbolic of idol worship, worshiping the sun. So I'm going to say something kind of heavy. Those who reject his Sabbath, Shabbat is the first thing we come to. Why? It teaches you to turn your back to idol worship the sun and worship the SOS sun, SON sun. So to reject Shabbat is to embrace idolatry in a sense, not judging hearts, in ignorance and it's with some in rebellion. He's jealous for his Sabbath. The steps of the altar are found within the combined ingredients even of the incense. That's a whole other thing. The fragrance of the kingdom has replaced the stench of sin and death. If you read, I have my stone additions chumash right here, all duct taped together. In chapter 43, verse 17, the rabbis are still confused. They're like, no, that can't mean steps to the altar. They go ahead and translate it as a ramp. I wonder why they're doing that. The Hebrew word for steps is u ma'alotehu, which means, and the steps of, look to your neighbor and say, ours. So the steps of that altar in the Haftor portion are steps that we have to take. Steps that we have to go through. You can't get around Yeshua saying, you know what? That's good and that's good, but uh, I don't know about this whole priesthood sacrificial thing. I'm going to kind of step around that and hold on to these other things. It's not going to work. You've got to go through the steps that he provided. There's no getting around it. Does that make sense? 
The value of this Hebrew phrase for the steps is equivalent to the, the Hebrew word Nizro Melech Sadiq, which means his Nazarite order in the Melchizedek priesthood. So in, concealed inside the steps of the altar of the Haftarah portion is the Nazarite order, the Nazarite sanctification in Yeshua after the order of Melchizedek. Does that make sense? There's always something concealed within the Hebrew text, and you can't find that any way else, any other way, only in the Hebrew text. We were called to be a kingdom of priests. I'm going to always say this until I take my last breath. We are called to be a kingdom of priests, not with a priesthood. You don't, you were never designed to wait on a guy once a year to go in before you to represent you, and hopefully he represented you right, because I didn't think, I didn't do what he did. You have been given access to come before the Father's throne in Yeshua to come before his courts and say, here's my case, Here who I am. here's who I am as a priest and a king of your kingdom because of what your son did, my king. We've been given this. We've been called to be a kingdom of priests, not a kingdom of prophets. That's what the church, I, I'm just speaking as the, as, as the fathers dropped in my spirit. That's what the church as a whole now, okay, in general, seems to be becoming. Everyone's a prophet now, but yet you can't even tell what is clean from unclean. A prophet does not have to be taught what is unclean. They know the voice True prophets know what goes in the body and what does not go in the body. That's why I threw something kind of strange out earlier on Facebook. I said, render the truth to give any leader out there preaching from the scriptures $100,000. Oh, I got it right here. Look at it. $100,000 if you can prove that the dietary laws have been done away with in Yeshua. I'm being sarcastic but truthful at the same time. If you can't do that, leaders, then stop lying to the people with the messages that come forth. You might have a prophetic gift on your life, but it is tainted with flies if you do not walk the narrow path of righteousness. <laughs> Exodus 19.6 says this. Remember, the Melchizedek order contains the prophetic anointing. It's called nevuah, prophecy. Exodus 19, 6 says, And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests, it was intended, and a holy nation. These are the words which you shall speak unto the children of Israel. 1 Peter 2, 9 says, But you are a chosen generation. Say, I have been chosen. Look at what Peter did. He, he pulls, he, every, it, there's the calling, many are called but few are chosen. So if chosen is looking at you, then you know that you're on the right path because you've been pulled out of the called. I'm not staying in the called. To be called can keep you in religious acts and traditions. To be chosen puts you on the path of power, dominion, authority, and the anointing of our king to accomplish something much more powerful than midrashing all the time to fill each other's head up with what I know. Who cares? Where's the empowerment of his spirit in and amongst the people to set the captives free? Give us a simple kingdom message with the anointing to break the yokes of bondage off of those that have been in, in prisons. Get all that we know into one simple message and say, Abba, let me be anointed for your mouthpiece for that. Why do we, why, how come so many powerful things, we don't chase the miraculous, have happened before? And we don't see it in the, in the groups that are constantly studying the Torah. You know why? Where not we as, as in us and here's per se, but many are so, they look like aliens in the spirit with big light bulb heads of knowledge, but no power, no one to plug them in. 
not trying to get loud. I'm just serious, passionate for his truth. We are a kingdom of priests, a chosen nation. Well, I was born through a rape. I was born, I wasn't supposed to be here. It was an accident. No, you're breathing. You're supposed to be here. The Father used that horrible situation to show something even more beautiful and powerful. You are not a mistake. You're not a mistake. I had to deal with this with some young people and families this week is you're not a mistake. If you're breathing, you're supposed to be here. Peter called it. Tetzave pictographically gives us a phrase. I'm going to kind of run through it. Each letter has a picture I believe is truly powerful, and it says this, the strong one, Mashiach, of the house through the covenant will be united and connected to his bride clothed in light. Clothed in light. Goodness gracious. To be clothed in light will blind the sin and death of the enemy. To be clothed in light means the blemishes and the wrinkles of the past will not even attempt to come close. Because not only are you clothed in light, you're, you're scented with the aroma of the king. And everywhere you move, the wind picks up your aroma and sends that and fills it into the place to where snakes and scorpions won't even try to come near that new Jerusalem walking around here. The revelation of the Mishkan is to reveal the uniting of the husband and his bride. This is the kingdom, and the borders of the kingdom are the very words which created all things from the beginning. I could go home with just that. This earth, you guys is the altar of Elohim. Did you hear what I said? There is so much in this, I can't even contain it. The earth is the altar of God. The earth is the altar of the creator. Golgotha is the altar of our great royal high priest king, Yeshua. I'm, I'm getting somewhere here. <clears throat> Let's look at this for a minute. The root of the portion name is tzava, which means to order, to constitute something. To constitute something means to be a part of the whole thing. That's what that basically means. It means to command. It means to enjoin something. It means to establish a law. Oh.